This monster has scared the people of West Virginia since 1952. It has a red face, glowing eyes, wears a hood shaped like the ace of spades. Some call it the Braxton County Monster, or Braxy for short. Others think it was a visitor from outer space. Even if you don't see it, you'll smell it. I'm Ella, and this week's episode is the Flatwoods Monster. Fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Well, I feel like I have the week off. I don't have to read the written intro here. Well, this is a very special <laughs> episode and week. Obviously, we have been joined by who we have now deemed our junior researcher, mm -hmm. my beautiful daughter, Ella Wallace-Brown. That's right. A round of applause for, I mean, we picked this episode for her. Mm -hmm. And I, we're so grateful that we were able to take the time to pull out some books. We would like drew pictures. So we'll post up our pictures of our, uh, Ella helped. We drew out a reenactment of the first incident. What we, you know, it's kind of like the first recorded incident, including like sound waves and smell lines. And she was <laughs> thorough and accurate. I am, I have to say she's a A plus 10 out of 10. We have a book called cryptids a to z or I'll, I'll post it on our links it's something like that but in it bigfoot is going around you know the country and he visits different cryptids but it's also the alphabet so f is the flatwoods monster and she's always asked who is that what is that one and so i finally said do you want us to cover that one would you like that and she said yes so what better time than after three weeks of pure hell to <laughs> hear from this angel and yes. kind of yes. a palate cleanser a bit. Definitely. Yeah. This one is, uh, it was chosen by her. You like, we like mentioned it offhand. I think you said something like, well, you know, Ella's favorite crypt is the Flatwoods monster. So weeks ago, we just put it in the show schedule of Flatwoods monster for Ella so that is <laughs> for this. So all of you who enjoy this episode, thank her because it's, I think it's one of her top favorite cryptids, I would guess. She, it's one of her tops. She, Nessie. Up there. She loves Mothman. Who doesn't? This one, too. Yeah. Bigfoot. I mean, I don't know that she's met a cryptid she doesn't like, to be honest. But we need to take a trip to West Virginia because we can cover Mothman and Flatwoods. You know, I don't know exactly how far away the two places are from each other. But I imagine we could, you know, make a long weekend out of it. Take a drive, take a drive across the state and find uh, all the cryptids that lurk within those beautiful country roads. <laughs> you know that we love that song so much. Shout out to John Denver. Uh, I don't want to brag, but he is an alumni of the same high school as me. So you were not in the same graduating class. We though. were not. Also, Lee Harvey Oswald. So, hey, congrats. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're pretty happy about that one. That one was you know, like the most famous. Your high school's got a hall of fame and it's just Lee Harvey Oswald, John Denver, Christy Wallace. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm not in that hall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Yet. we'll see. I need, to, I honestly would love to be able to like go back and look at my high school now, but I don't think they just let adults that don't have kids there walk in as well. They shouldn't, you right? Know? I think what they should do for the nostalgia purposes is open the high school like homecoming weekend and say, like, Hey, from five to seven, you can, and like it's supervised, but you can come wander around the halls mm -hmm. and kind of reminisce for like a $5 donation to the PTA and do it like a fundraiser. That's a but great then, idea. Anyway, you're welcome, PTAs. Take my idea, including John Horn High School, because I would love to walk through my old yes. high school as well. Including Arlington Heights High School in Fort Worth. I have looked at pictures online and it appears vastly different from when I went. So, but I'm sure a lot of it is the same. Yeah. I want to go. I want to see what's going on. At the bones are the same. Certainly. You're right though. I saw a picture of my old high school and I was like, that looks like 
the space age. It looks like the mall. I mean, like the <laughs> fancy mall in the year 2025, not 2025, 2055. Like it looks all glass and spacey and shit. And I was like, Mac, in my day, we had, uh, did our plays in the multi-purpose room. We didn't even have a stage. Nice. My high school was built in the forties. Oh, so it's always looked very old, but I thought that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it too, like the structure of it was very interesting with like, brick staircases out in the courtyard that led from one level to the next and stuff it was old timey but cool but at once so cool the type of beautiful grounds that would inspire folk songs and or a podcast about cryptids and other Perhaps horrible so. things or uh, or the assassination of a president <laughs> who knows it's all three you know it's all inspirational in its own way uh this one though also i like about it's a cryptid, but it's also a UFO. So it dovetails nicely with our current obsession, which is of UFOs and extraterrestrials. Yeah. I don't want to call it obsession as much as a lifestyle, Heather. <laughs> and uh, I, like I said, it's not, um, I'm not speculating. It's not like, <laughs> are you skeptical? It's like, I just accept it as fact. Yes. And that's that. That's, that's how it is, period. <laughs> Uh, that's the lens through which we will uh, examine the Flatwoods today. <laughs> well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. John Denver sang about it, and Mothman sailed above it. So we know that along those sweet country roads of West Virginia lurks something mysterious. Braxton County, West Virginia, lies in the central part of the state. It is home to around 20,000 West Virginians, with coal mines scattered across the region to the north and south. The county extends across four small towns and several unincorporated areas, with a stretch of highway running through. One of these towns is the quiet community of Flatwoods, a small community of around 300 residents, most of whom have lived there all their lives. Lifelong resident Ed May described Flatwoods in an interview with filmmakers as a nice country community where everybody knew everybody. On September 12, 1952, Ed and a group of other schoolboys around his age were enjoying the clear skies and nice weather in a field near the local elementary school in Flatwoods. Brothers Eddie and Freddie May were tossing a football alongside Neil Nunley, Teddy Neal, and a small boy named Tommy Heyer, according to the May brothers. Suddenly, the football wasn't the only thing flying through the sky. The boys watched in awe as an object flew overhead. The glowing round orb was as large as a house and traveled from north to south. Unbeknownst to the boys at the time, there were actually six reported unidentified aerial phenomena that night. This was like such a time for ufology and aerial phenomena in the skies. It kind of kicked off in like 1947 with a pilot who saw this like a squadron kind of of weird lights. And then it became kind of like flying saucers. And in July of 1952, there was a sighting of by air force guys, not too far from that, you know, a couple months earlier of these like weird orbs that are flying in a formation, kind of crossing this air force base, air force base. We know the aliens love the Air Force bases and other government facilities. That's what I was thinking of. Like, they're going to obviously if stuff is up in the air and they're going to see where it came from and where it goes and then follow it there. But they said it flew over them like it was looking at them. You turned and then flew back the like towards the west away from them. And this was also during, you know, a tumultuous time where a lot of military aircraft was being tested and designed. And I mean, wars were going on, had been going on, were upcoming. All I had to do was Google which war was happening in the 1950s <laughs> because I knew there was one. There definitely was. I just didn't know which one it was. Right. So, yeah, living out there and you're near a, a facility, so you see things flying overhead a lot. But all that to say, if you see it flying over a lot, seems like you would know when you saw something that was out of the ordinary. Oh, yeah. And you'd say like... Oh, those are jets. And that's what Fred and Ed May have said. We know what jets are. We know what airplanes are. I mean, it was the 1950s, so it's not like it was, you know, airplanes flying over all the time. But being anywhere near Washington, D.C., you're going to see and hear military aircraft. So seeing something that, like, sticks out to you, like, hmm, that's kind of weird. And you're a kid. You'd be like, let's go see it. Mm Mm-hmm. Fred May told filmmakers for The Flatwoods Monster, A Legacy of Fear. While we was playing, we seen a ball of fire come across the sky. Curious, the kids ran toward the object's path, 
trying to see what had fallen from above. If it was a meteor, the boys hoped they might find a bit of gold or precious metal inside. But the way the object landed was particularly strange to Fred May, who said later, It wasn't like a shooting star or anything real fast. It was like floating down, but it looked like a ball of fire, and it come down over the ridge. Knowing there was a flat over that same ridge, the boys headed up the road to check it out. The route to get to the ridge passed right by the Mays' house. Their mother, Kathleen, was inside, visiting with a distant cousin, 17-year-old National Guardsman Jean Lemon. Mrs. May, a single mom with a feisty personality, and Jean both decided to join the boys in their hunt. Kathleen was a beautician, active member of the local civic group, and a devoted mother. Jean grabbed a flashlight, and the pair joined the boys in their hunt up toward the ridge. The town dog, Ricky, even followed along, too. <laughs> oh, collie-type dog followed him up there. Come on, Ricky! Come on, Ricky! Let's go see what. Let's go up there and find that crash site. The group headed toward an area known as the Bailey Fisher Farm. They had to traverse knee-high grass that sometimes grew even taller. At one point, Mrs. May unlocked the gate to a fence blocking their path. A good neighbor, Mrs. May locked it back behind her, not knowing she had just locked herself on the wrong side of the fence. By this time, darkness had fallen. Jean, armed only with a flashlight, shined it around the area. Ed later said in an interview, We just went up the hill. We didn't know what to expect or what we was looking for. When they approached the highest point of the ridge, the group saw an object lying in the grass. They later described it to be somewhat pear-shaped and as large as a small house. The shiny black object also glowed, alternating between orange and bright red. It was surrounded by a thick mist that emitted a pungent odor. The mist only rose to about knee-high on the adults, but the dog was walking toward the thick of it. According to Ed May, the dog ran toward the object, barking. When the canine got closer and was engulfed in the mist, it howled and ran off, back toward town. Early reports later stated the dog died as a result of this interaction, but both May brothers assured filmmakers in 2018 that the dog survived. Honestly, in early uh, retellings of this, it was like the, the dog sniffed it and he went all the way back to town and threw up a bunch of times and died. And I was so devastated and it was so refreshing to see the two people that were actually there were like, oh, the dog lived. He, he run off, but he was fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part about That's this. That's a good example of uh, how legends can be stretched. Mm -hmm. Tall tales become even taller. And as they're retold, you know, you might embellish things to make it a little more dramatic. But when I was reading this to Ella, because I, I read it to her before, before she lost interest and asked if she could go outside. <laughs> I was like, that's cool. I'm halfway through. That's no worries. Fine. Uh, you're like, I hope our listeners don't say the same thing. Listen, <laughs> you can go out. If you're listening and you're bored, keep playing. You can go outside too, though. That's permission. You can. Yeah. But she's, when I got to this point, even after I said, they said the dog didn't die, she goes, does the dog die? And I was like, no. They assured filmmakers in 2018 the dog survived. So yeah. we can all rest comfortably knowing the little dog is totally fine. Ricky, that collie dog is fine. And that's, but you're right. Like it's the things in the newspaper would get stretched and stretched. So they might have heard, oh, a dog ran off and then someone's added and then died. Where really a, a lot of this stuff, Fred and Ed May would go like, that's why we quoted from them primarily because a lot of the stuff that's out there, they're like, that's bullshit. That didn't happen. <laughs> Which to me lends credence that it's not just, you know, your cookie neighbor mm -hmm. going, I saw a flying chalupa out there with a sour cream on it. You know, it's like, no, I will tell you calmly what I saw and you can make what you will of it. Mm -hmm. And I think when you don't embellish and you're just facts only, it, yeah, like you said, it gives more credence to the story because you're like, I'm just telling it like it was. I'm not trying to make a buck off this. Exactly. Like, I'm a witness, not a, I'm not a proponent of a theory. I'm not a storyteller. Sinisterhood will be right back. Oh, I just did one of those where I really needed to Athena club myself. And then I did it. <laughs> and that, cause I just waited. I was like, ah, rah, rah. and then I was like, what was I waiting for? I went full cloud foam lather and then came out and put on this like decadent lotion. I was like, Oh, I was just, I felt so moisturized. It's the best razor I've ever had. Hands down. There's also just the no best looking razor I've ever had. 
It's so the sexy, sleek feel. That's why Athena Club's razor has thousands of five-star reviews from customers. The magic starts with the Athena Club razor blades. They're surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, so you get a silky smooth shave that actually leaves your skin soft and hydrated. Because I was stripped dry. If I use like a cheap drugstore razor, it just wrecks my skin. I hate it. Ugh. Yeah, it's not smooth. We've all I I did the ugh because I just imagined those. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. you know what I'm talking about. Pain. Well, the Athena Club Razor Kit is only $10 and comes with two blade cartridges, a very clutch magnetic hook for shower storage. It sticks right there. If you've got little hands, you don't want to reach and stuff, or you just want to keep it like up off so it can drain. You're not having to like leave it on the, the edge of the tub or something. It's so awesome. You can also choose your choice of handle color. I have rose gold and navy, but Mm -hmm. they also have so many colors to choose from. Chic black, white, neon, pastel, whatever you've got going on in your bathroom, whatever your decor is, whatever your vibe is, Athena Club's got you. Yeah, you can match anything, and you're not going to run out of razor blades or go dull because you get refills sent on your schedule. You just have to choose how often you need the fresh blades. They just send them automatically with free shipping. I forget stuff all the time, so I love to have a nice little spray. I'm like, oh, I did need to replace this. Thanks. So that's why I always have the best blades for the best shave, and you can too. You also, like Heather said, you got to get that cloud shave foam. It's so thick. It stays on while you shave. It doesn't fall off, so you're constantly having to reapply. It smells great, and it leaves your skin feeling amazing. I just have a PSA. Don't go wild with it because other shave gels, it'll just, you have to use so much of it. A, lo- a little goes a long way. That is very true. I've had the same bottle for so long because a little does go a long way. Well, show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Get started with Athena Club today by shopping in-store at Target Nationwide. Just head to the shaving aisle and buy your razors and refills. The impromptu search party stood staring at the craft until one of the boys noticed a nearby oak tree standing alone on the top of the ridge. Floating up near the leaves of the tree, the youngest boy pointed to a creature. It was about the size of a heavyset man with a red face and glowing eyes. It appeared to be scanning the horizon, moving its eyes back and forth in a northerly direction. Based on its proximity to the tree, The witnesses estimated the mysterious creature was around 12 to 15 feet tall. It moved by gliding with no visible lower extremities. It had a cowl around the back of its head, shaped like the spade from a deck of playing cards. Its body was described as having a gray or green light color. Mrs. May described the lower part as hanging like drapes, its arms extended with claw-like mechanisms at the end. According to transcripts of a recorded interview with Mrs. May, no one else noticed it at first until the younger boy pointed it out. She said, When Jean's flashlight beam hit it, it lit up like a Christmas tree. We all noticed it all at the same time, and it was right there. The whole thing lit up instantly. I was less than 20 feet from the monster and made a hissing sound like like frying bacon. Jean dropped the flashlight and screamed. Jean then tripped over one of the May brothers before the whole group ran off. Mrs. May said in the same interview, It was a hideous sight, and I wish I had not seen it. (laughs) Some things you can't unsee, (laughs) Mrs. May. I get it. She's already a single mom of a bunch of rowdy boys. She's she's just trying to do some makeup at the local (laughs) salon. She's not trying to have her life changed by this. Single mom who works two jobs (laughs) off Flatwood Monster in the streets. (laughs) No, saw Flatwood's monster, then ran off. (laughs) <laughs> Sick of people asking her about it now. Because you know what? You're like the, really the only grown up. Technically, Gene is 17 and in the National Guard, which like it sucks for him that it was like hero National Guardsman dropped the flashlight, screamed and ran away with the other children. <laughs> yeah, his buddies gave him a real hard time when he got nice. back. Oh, is it a Flatwoods Monster Lemon? He's like, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Don't be so sour, Lemon. Stop it. Completely unrelated, but... On the new Survivor, one of the team's name, the one of the teams. Gosh, I'm sorry, Jeff Probst. I know you listen. One yeah. of the tribe's names is Reba, and when oh, they yeah. announced it to them, not one person made a Reba McIntyre joke. And I paused it to discuss this with Tommy. This I was song- like, there were so many opportunities here for you to be like, "Ooh, that's fancy." 
And, you know, like any kind of call out, not no one, no, I'm three episodes in, no one has made a reference. That's such a fail because the song says, I'm a survivor. Yes. That's the word. It's in I know. the song. <laughs> I, I'm going to chalk it up to, they're all just high on adrenaline Objective, from being yeah. there and they, they forgot. Or... The producers left it out when they were editing everything together, and <laughs> that is also a huge fail. Yeah, put it at least put it as like a I don't know if Survivor does like Big Brother After Dark. Like you need Survivor on the cutting room floor, and it's all the wacky jokes and fun things that happen. I just said that I said I want to see a behind the scenes of how they set up all of the challenges. Right. I mean, especially in the water, it's wild. The size of these things and now they've for many years they've filmed it all on fiji so i'm sure that they just store it all there and can bring it out and but i mean it takes it takes a lot they do have a um because after you get voted off once you get to that point you go to this little place around there called ponderosa where you stay until it, I think it's only if you are voted off once it gets to the jury portion okay. and then they have to bring you back over, you know, for the jury stuff. And they will do like um, behind the scenes stuff there, but I haven't found anything that shows how they set it all up. That would be interesting because it's one thing to build that stuff on a soundstage, but for it to be in partially in the ocean at some time, oh, yeah. or in the, you know, wilderness, I mean, to that extent, it's out in nature, but oh, that's, it's, it's an extremely a full impressive. on jungle. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it is very impressive. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, but Miss, you're right. Miss, old Miss May, she's a survivor. <laughs> she's a survivor, just like Reba. Just like Reba. And yeah, being a single mom in the 1950s, that's, you know, wasn't easy back then. No, it's not easy now. Never. Definitely wasn't easy then. Yeah. After hissing, the creature began gliding toward the group from up near the tree, around its craft in a C-shaped pattern toward where the witnesses had been standing. Frozen in fear, one of the boys peed his pants, said a friend of the boys in a later interview. Fred told interviewers for a legacy of fear that he wasn't sure what he and the rest of the group was feeling. Afraid, confused, or what? Everybody just turned around and took off. Their escape was hindered by the neighbor's six-foot fence that Mrs. May had so politely locked back. According to early reports, as the boys scrambled around it, over it, and in between some of its planks, Mrs. May jumped over the fence entirely. In a later interview, Ed expressed how afraid his mother had been at the time, saying with a laugh, She's an athletic type, but not that athletic type. Yeah. <laughs> this bitch said, she hurtled it. <laughs> I'm raising five boys by myself. I'll be goddamned if this is what's going to take me out. And just... Just straight up jumped over a six foot fence. That's what he was like. She like she left over the side of it. He's like they reported it. She did. And then of course the littlest one I think said he found a, a spot kind of behind a bush and was able to kind of squeeze through. But some of the boys just straight up just elbowed the planks and smashed the wood planks out of it and just scooted their bodies through. But she was like, nope, whoop, <laughs> right you over got that fear strength where. Right. You're just running on pure adrenaline and you're capable of doing things you didn't think you could. If it's a huge thing with a red face, big old glowing eyes, and then it not only does it have this weird burnt smell, but if it hisses and moves towards you, there is not – I I make the five-minute mile – I make a three-minute mile. <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> fast out of there. According to Fred, the group ran back to the May house where they sat, stunned in silence. Meanwhile, a farmer across the ridge was watching the area with binoculars. He saw an object in the distance, glowing red and pulsating while getting dimmer and dimmer. Eventually, about 20 minutes after the farmer had seen it, the object disappeared into a pinpoint of light. And that's the word. It's like they pinpointed or it winked out. That's a UFO term. I guess it just goes so fast it looks like a little wink of light. but Or it vaporizes into another realm, <gasps> slips through a portal. <laughs> Slips through a time, a time, what do we say? Time warp? It's a time warp. Or like the other day I said to Tommy, do you think if people like Victor Vescovo, if like you can get down to those depths in the ocean that you could just be like cruising around in your little thing and then you turn a corner and all of a sudden it's like the abyss and you're just in an alien like underground camp? And he goes, no, they only let us see stuff that they want us to see. So I think it would be so camouflaged that you wouldn't even know. And I had not considered that. And now I got some things to think about. Because yeah, if, yeah. if, you know, we can't, there's, 
we can't see all the colors. We already know that there's a lot of colors like the mm-hmm. human eye can't see. So if they're on a different frequency, they might be able to just like make things appear and disappear at whim. And we don't, there could be an alien standing next to me right now. And I don't know it. That's how I feel because if there's any relation between sea life and what we consider like an extraterrestrial, like something we've never seen that would be uh, movable throughout our society. A non-human creature. Like a non-human creature. I always think about that species of octopus that could completely camouflage itself to look exactly like a rock. That's a lot, might be a lot of species, but I've specifically, it's called nature is lit subreddit. It's a really good subreddit, (laughs) but it's just really wild, like animal videos. But to think that if a octopus is up against this rock and it can, it's whatever type it is, it looks exactly like the Mm -hmm. rock, whatever that mechanism technology, wouldn't you be able to have something huge and just be like, wow, that looks like a giant rock or coral Mm -hmm. reef or like the seafloor, but really it's not, it's really just a hatch. Yeah. Tommy also brought up um, the Meg two uh, (laughs) theory of, At the bottom of the Mariana Trench, there's just a layer of what we think is the ground. But really, if you push past that underneath, there's a whole other thing happening down there. We got to get double V down there. V squared. Victor Vescovo (laughs) has got to get down into the. He's gone to the Mariana Trench. I want to see Victor Vescovo down in between the cracks. I I want V squared to penetrate the crack. Oh, don't we all? I just thought about (laughs) him falling off that boat. He was trying so hard. The winds, <laughs> the winds, his ponytail was flapping so oh, hard. Oh, God, wind. we rewatched that so much. <laughs> he tried so hard to play that off and look cool. But, buddy, you're in the middle of the ocean. It's real, <laughs> it's real rough out there. Sometimes it gets the better of you. What is that show called? Operation Deep, Deep Water? Operation Deep Water? Or Deep, deep Water? Deep Dive or something o- like that. Deep Water? Deep Ocean? Type in Victor Vescovo on the internet. Victor Type Vescovo. in D- Victor Vescovo deep penetration and then see what you get. <laughs> Victor Vescovo deepest trench penetration you've ever seen. <laughs> Victor Vescovo. V key squared goes deep. <laughs> the main I'm sorry, thing that's we- going to be featured online on a website called Porn Sub. I had to say it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know we're about to go back to the outline, but it would have hurt my brain if I didn't. No, that was worth it. Thank you. It was worth it. Now I'm just thinking of (laughs) a very niche type of porn, and it's just all underwater. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of mermaid stuff. You know, people are into mermaids. Oh, yeah. Mermaids, mermans, all sorts of mers. The May family wasn't the only one to experience this creature. A few days before September 12th, Audra Harper, a child, was walking with a friend in the wooded area around five miles north of Flatwoods. The girls initially saw what they believed to be a hunter's campfire until they got closer. The fire vanished and was replaced with a tall, dark silhouette of a man-shaped figure, according to the Braxton County official website. Harper and her friend ran as fast as they could over barbed wire and up a rocky area until they reached safety. The monster didn't leave town after meeting the maze either. On September 13th, a couple named George and Edith Santowski experienced car trouble on Route 4. George noticed a terrible odor and got out to check the car. Edith spotted a 10-foot tall creature approaching from behind him. She screamed, and he was able to get back into the vehicle. This creature was not wearing its spade-shaped hood. According to the Braxton County website, this creature's head was reportedly reptilian and bony. It had no legs to be seen and dragged its lizard-like hand across the hood of the car before drifting away into the woods. Uh, well, the History Channel Monster Quest show. Yes, yes, the History Channel has a show <laughs> called Monster Quest. Of course they do. There's be weird course, if they didn't at this point. <laughs> they would be, it would be a, a huge gap in their programming. But this is, uh, it's called like Green Monster, or Green Lizard from Outer Space. And it's all about the Flatwoods. And the Snitowskis talked to an investigator who got them to draw a composite, like a sketch. And um, I'll be honest with you, it <laughs> looks like somebody drew sexualized fan art of Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> 
And by that, I mean, it's like metal Dalek slash uh, like Doctor Who kind of metal uh, from the stomach down, kind of like a half. Like a trash can or like a TARDIS? TARDIS, yeah, sort of like that, like the, the, the robot thing. And then the top, he's like yoked like he's got a six pack <laughs> no hair like no fur but green and then they're Edith like knew what she wanted she knew. <laughs> and they were like two fingers on each hand only two and i was like that's all you need sometimes <laughs> and then bald just hairless and just but muscular and i was like all right okay okay edith yeah the, were it not for the stench the snitowskis might have and they had their 18 month old in the back seat they might have invited him in the cars maybe <laughs> yeah but you had to think that you're just your car stops late at night and you're like, oh, well, they wouldn't have even really have known by then if it was less than, you know, mm-hmm. it was like right at 24 hours later. It was like the next night that you're just passing through and your car stops and your wife's like, yeah, honey, get out and check it. What the hell? Because she saw it in the headlights. He's just looking over the hood. Meanwhile, a 10 foot sexy Oscar the Crouch is coming <laughs> at up you. behind you. Damn. Famed British biologist and writer Ivan Sanderson arrived in Flatwoods just a few days after the incident and questioned the witnesses with help from journalist Gray Barker, who would later rise to prominence for his coverage of the Mothman. In a later radio interview, Sanderson called the witnesses to the Flatwoods incident a highly skeptical group and stated emphatically, none of those people were telling lies. A local newspaper publisher, A. Lee Stewart, said at the time, Those people were the most scared people I've ever seen. People don't make up that kind of story that quickly. Stewart must have been somewhat of a believer himself, as he marched up to the area of the incident with a shotgun shortly thereafter, though he did not find the monster. And Sanderson said he and Gray Barker interviewed uh, the kids individually. He said they paired them up in different pairings to see if their story would change depending on who they were with. Brought the mom in for some of them, took her out, brought everybody together. And he said they would have seen, you know, there was slight variations in what they'd seen. But fundamentally, overall, what they were saying was the truth. And he said he was impressed because he's like kids that are like 10 years old. You can't memorize a story so well that you recite it in a natural way over the course of various interviews so he's like i'm not saying it was an alien out there i'm just saying these people saw so it's like randall nickerson like the aerial phenomenon like i will say they they believe what they're saying or dr john mack they believe themselves yeah and i was going to compare it to the aerial phenomenon as well those kids all had the same story and they were also separated and drew pictures and these boys were too and they all drew the same pictures so I think that a lot of people tend to think that kids as witnesses are less reliable. I would say they're almost more reliable because it is harder for them to lie and especially lie well. Yes. Yeah. That's what Ivan Sanderson was like. You can get kids to make up a story, but for them to be able to repeat it in like a a cogent manner, like they Mm -hmm. can't keep it up. And it was the same like with aerial phenomenon. Like there's 60 of them. At some point it's going to vary or slight. like, no, people's brains aren't that good (laughs) to be able to, you know, I'm going to maybe like some real, you know, true psychopaths who take on an entire other persona, but a 10 year old kid who was chucking a football and was like, I don't know, it was a weird thing I saw. And Multiple kids that yes. all have the same story. And once you get a group of kids, at some point, one of them is going to crack, you know? Right. And, and with the aerial school and this, like none of them ever did. They all maintain their stories. They stuck with it. Sinisterhood will be right back. We love working with Audio Boom Studios. And we love when new shows come out that are affiliated mm-hmm. with Audio Boom because we know they're going to be high quality now. Presented by Audio Boom Studios and Woodcut Media, we've got What Makes a Killer Season 5. What Makes a Killer is the true crime podcast that explores some of the most twisted minds behind the most notorious crimes. When you tune in, the host, Jennifer Natoso, it's not, you know, it's not just going to be an overview in general. There's going to be examining the motives, the method, the aftermath, you know, not just the case, but then also what comes next. And season five is going to actually dive into the son of Sam, David Berkowitz, as well as the vampire of Krakow, Carol Cott, and of course more. But that David Berkowitz, something like that, where you kind of know the case, a new deep dive, that's going to give you a whole new perspective you haven't even thought of before. I love having a very well-rounded picture when I want to learn about something. And that is exactly what Jennifer does. Also by interviewing detectives, family members, forensic experts, and even some of the survivors. What Makes a Killer gives insight into the events that turned 
these people into cold-blooded killers. Go ahead and get caught up. Binge the first four seasons right now on your favorite podcast app. New episodes drop every Thursday. Follow What Makes a Killer on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. According to investigator Dave Spinks, whose family was local to the area, the government was on the scene in short order. This included investigators from Project Blue Book, a faction of the U.S. Air Force assembled to investigate UFO sightings. National Guardsmen were also dispatched to the original site. Spinks told documentary filmmakers for A Legacy of Fear. The original crash site, what I find very compelling about that, essentially a crack team of Special Forces personnel were sent into that area covertly by the U.S. Air Force. One of those troops on site, Captain Leavitt, later said he distinctly remembered an impression in the ground with a circumference of about 20 feet. He also discovered an oily substance in the grass and the smell of burnt sulfur. And that was part of the original witness's uh, statement was that it seemed frightened and it shot out some type of an oil or or it was a defense mechanism or it was afraid. It's like trying to oil up the engine. It was like, ah, you startled me. Or so, uh, what are those uh, like skunk? But there's another one I'm thinking of that shoots oil on, or some kind of gross, stinky thing when like it's scared. Bug. Yeah, stink bugs or even squids. You know, they shoot out ink as a manner of getting away. Uh Uh-oh. Your face just dropped. Well. Oh, yeah. 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 Even squids? Yeah. Even squids? Yeah. So it's a land squid is what I'm hearing. (laughs) So. Land squid. squid. Candy gram. (laughs) Hell yeah. SNL writers. First of all, hire us. Second of all, let's revamp Land Shark with Land Squid. (laughs) Bringing it back. We're bringing it back. But on a, I'll say, serious note with this cryptid investigation. But for real, this, this, uh, what is the name? Captain Leavitt eventually became a colonel in the Air Force. And he forever maintained, like, this is a real thing. I was really sent out there to to see it. He said it was a 30-man unit from the West Virginia National Guard that went out there. So half went one way, half went the other way. They found debris. They found burn vegetation this like indentation so to the extent that you're like what even was there was something out there that night in 1952 it's just what do you think it was but to send the i think the sheriffs kind of came out first but they were investigating another crash which ivan sanderson believed was one of the six ufos flying in formation with the flatwoods craft that night so the sheriff couldn't even come to this incident scene until a couple hours after he was called because he was at a different crash site something else from the sky crashed in the side of the mountain he had a lot to talk about that he's night like, when he got home He's with like, his God wife. Damn, what the hell? What am I <laughs> supposed to do? The sheriff said he found oil, too, and Levitt both said they found oil and that in- independently turned it over to the federal government and never heard anything back about what it was. And Mrs. May got oil on her dress, which she, she also handed over to the government, and they said, we're going to test this and give it back to you. She never heard another word. Man, so not she, only do you not know what it was, but also you just took my dress. Like, I would have worn that. Like, what the hell, <laughs> I probably could have washed it out. She's a single mom of a bunch of boys. She knows how to get stains out. Oh, easily. Oh, yeah, she, she knows how to get stains she, out. She knows. That's like a Tide commercial. Like, you, <laughs> I'm a single mom of three boys in West Virginia. Not only that, an alien spunked all over my apron. <laughs> but you know what? I'm not giving this one to the U.S. government. I'm getting the stain out myself. <laughs> I'm Kathleen May here for Tide. <laughs> oh, I'd Miss May. I'd watch that. But Miss May, poor thing, not only so she said she then later got a letter from I think she claimed it was from the Pentagon that essentially was like, don't talk about this anymore. She said it that she said, I can't remember the exact details. Mother, please keep a copy of things like that. <laughs> yeah, you gotta put that. In the the safe or what do you have? A, a hope chest, probably a hearth. Yeah. I don't something behind the but hearth. In the ice box, the fire chest. I don't know something. But mm-hmm. basically, the government said you didn't see anything. Those were merely experimental rockets. And so she's like, well, whatever. It said, don't tell anyone. Then she went on TV. So you know what? I pre- <laughs> she just, she's not gonna let the government keep her down. Yeah. Right. Ultimately, the government concluded the sightings were not credible, chalking it up to a case of mass hysteria amongst the witnesses. As far as what they saw, the theory was posited that the monster was actually a barn owl perched in a tree. These types of owls are known for their heart-shaped faces, which could also resemble the ace of spades-like head the witnesses reported seeing. Similarly, 
Foliage from the tree could have been mistaken by the panicked onlookers as some type of clothing or suit. The colors from the green grass and glowing red craft reflected off the Allen tree made it appear as if it had a green body and red face. What do you think about this owl theory? I haven't talked as much about owls since Staircase. Yeah, right. Where um, what was the other one everybody thought was an owl? Was it a Jersey Devil? It was a bird. That was a different. Type oh of yeah, bird. the crane. Uh, there's been a lot of cranes. Sandhill crane. That's what that Sandhill one. crane. Blaming everything on a bird. I think that the owl theory in this situation is misguided because it is primarily based on sort of the fluffed up version of the tale. Because like. The Fred and Ed May, who at least, you know, up until 2018 when the documentary interviews with them was conducted, were, you know, still alive and weren't saying, oh, it was a 17 foot green monster with scaly skin. They were like, it was some machinery thing. We really don't know what it was, but it seemed machinish. Like it looked mm-hmm. rounded off and machinish. And they said, I don't think it was alive. I don't think it was a person. I don't, like it was something machinish. And so anytime I see like, oh, well, it was definitely a, an owl. I'm like, well, they didn't really that doesn't really jive with like the two key witnesses. And so I don't really, it could be that the hissing sound they heard was like an owl nearby, certainly. Um, but or I yeah. something from the craft, like, you know, if you wreck your car and hissing is coming out and stuff like that. True. Like a, the of like mm-hmm. a hydraulics or something, but there's a, uh, in addition to the lovely folk song, there is a more jazzy Randy Newman esque song about the Flatwoods monster. And the lyrics include the people of West Virginia know the difference between an alien and an owl. And I would agree with that. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to spell it out. Just give them more credit, man. Mm-hmm. Joe Nickel, a member of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, investigated the sighting in 2000 and more or less agreed with the government. Nickel concluded the light the boys saw in the sky was most likely a meteor. Reports at the time showed a meteor had been spotted in three states that same September 12th evening, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Nickel believes the pulsating red light was from a type of aircraft, perhaps even a beacon. A beacon because you got to be found? Because they're looking for the The spaceship. (laughs) They're they're (laughs) flashing for help from their home planet. Not everyone, however, subscribes to the meteor theory. Others think the craft was a product of the government's secret weapons program. This could explain why men in black figures were spotted around town. Rather than looking for an alien, the feds were more interested in recovering a top secret military aircraft. Since being close to D.C., I feel like this is... More in the realm of where my mm-hmm. stomach is moving towards. If there's somebody, some, uh, some government, something. I, I on. got some stuff for so what do we think? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Same. It's like uh, the, the government. there's a governmental undercurrent through all of this. For sure. Although the government has never been very forthcoming with information regarding the incident, those that were on that hill that September evening have always remained adamant that what they saw was not from this world. Jason Burns, a storyteller who specializes in paranormal stories in West Virginia, told WBOY 12. They tied it in with other stories around the country about the same time. This was the age of the space race, so there's a lot of interest in interstellar crafts. This was a time of Roswell, this was a time of Sputnik, and things like that were getting ready to take off. So it was the very forefront in people's minds. So people were thinking maybe it was just mass hysteria, maybe it was fake, maybe it was just made up. But I actually have met the Maze at one point years ago, a long time ago, in Flatwoods at one event, and they are very adamant. They saw what they saw. And I believe, they believe, you, you know, I believe them, what they saw, what they saw. Like, that's what it was. Uh, now, what it was, I don't know. Executive Director of the Braxton County Visitor Center, Andrew Smith, agrees that the witnesses know what they saw and that their statements shouldn't be dismissed so quickly. A saying in an interview, We're not talking about dumb people here either. I mean, I know we're talking about 1952 in rural West Virginia, but not, you know, not dumb by any stretch of the imagination. Smith believes one of the most compelling pieces of evidence are the drawings the boys made of the monster soon after seeing it. Independently, all the children drew the same thing. Local musician Colby White has his own theory about what happened that night that he shared with WV Public Broadcasting. Here comes a bunch of kids, a woman shining a flashlight in this dude's eyes or this creature's eyes. Next thing he knows, he's getting blinded and freaks out and starts vibrating, basically throws up some kind of weird oil on them. So I think they startled him. That's my theory. I think they startled the Flatwoods monster. 
who amongst us hasn't been startled and a little something came out. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're like, Whoa, whoops. Oh, oopsie. <laughs> I like that he, um, Colby White is, he is a character and he has uh, various cryptid tattoos that are featured in this article. One of which is a very nice rendition of the Flatwoods monster. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that. But yeah, you know what? Throw your two cents in there. It does make the most sense. He's just vibing in the woods. And then all of a sudden you got a passel of kids hollering at you, (laughs) shining lights on you. It's freak any of us out. You don't know what, what's coming your way. He's just as scared. Of them as they are of him. Exactly. For their part, the small town of Flatwoods has embraced their local monster with open arms. Second only to Mothman, the Flatwoods monster is the second most popular cryptid to hail from the state of West Virginia. Driving in from Highway 119 North, visitors are greeted by a large hanging sign that reads, Welcome to Flatwoods, home of the Green Monster. The green monster is just one of the creature's many monikers in addition to the Flatwoods monster. It is also affectionately known as the Braxton County monster, Phantom of Flatwoods, and Braxy. Oh, Braxy. Some, you got to shorten it. You got to give him a little nickname. No, oh, Braxy. Around Flatwoods, evidence of Braxy is everywhere. Five huge chairs designed by a local artist have been constructed and placed around town for both tourists and locals to relax in as they take in the sights. A local ice cream shop called The Spot has also leaned into the fun, offering photo ops with a painted version of the monster. These chairs? I want to sit in it. I do too. And I also would like to say, I don't think they're chairs as much as thrones. They are so big that they have a staircase that leads up to where you have to sit because that's how big they are. But they're very impressive and they're huge and they're all designed to look like the Flatwoods monster and just kind of around town, the whole town. I mean, it's, it's also like uh point pleasant. Is that it? It's also uh-huh. like point pleasant, you know, I mean, they've leaned into all the Mothman stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a fun thing that I like when small towns don't shy away from something just because it's unconventional or might be creepy or weird and people don't want to talk about it. They're like, no, Call round up everybody. We're the whole town. We're decorating it. Flatwoods. Right. We will have giant thrones in the in the likeness of the Flatwoods monster. But it's smart to have the chairs because you can sit in it and take a picture. But also, kind of that height and the arms out from the distance in the dark. You know, if people are you know, get a little fright while you're driving around town, you're like, oh shit, there's a Flatwoods monster. Oh, it's just <laughs> one of the chairs. It's just one of the chairs. Founded by Andrew Smith, the official Flatwoods Monster Museum opened in October of 2017 in nearby Sutton, West Virginia. Here, visitors can enjoy mixed media renderings of the monster from local artists, see with their own eyes original pieces of wood taken from the tree at the crash site, and pick up some Flatwoods Monster merchandise, including the famous Flatwoods Ceramic Lantern. Originally produced in 1960 by the Braxton County Junior Chamber of Commerce, the lanterns are both the oldest and longest-running produced novelty items made to commemorate the 1952 sighting. These one-of-a-kind pieces are handmade by an artist in Marietta, Ohio, and can be purchased at the museum as well as the local Exxon gas station. For those not in the area, the unique lanterns can be ordered at cryptidmart.com for $80, a much steeper price than the original $5 for which they were sold in the 60s. For a deeper dive into the history and making of the lanterns, a 22-minute short film covering the story can be viewed at braxtonwv.org. Yes, I did watch all 22 minutes. And it's actually (laughs) very interesting. I love this. It talks to um, the man who kind of started in the Braxton County chamber of commerce they were like we need to capitalize on this like what can we do and he hooked up with a traveling salesman that also lived in the area but he said hey i know some people that do ceramics i think we could make some molds and get you know these these lanterns going and the i believe the salesman has since passed but they had his son on who is now an adult that was like I remember sitting at the kitchen table and we had like 500 of these lanterns in our house and me and my sisters all had to, our job was to paint the bodies green. And then my mom and dad would be in charge of painting the head and the, you know, the finishing features. And it, 
they sold like 500 of these things, but then they said sales tapered. Oh, they, no. They tapered off. I want everyone to know I fully intended to buy one of these and they are currently sold out. So Damn it. hopefully they'll be restocked soon. Maybe we can reach out. Maybe if enough of us reach out and they're like, we got to have the lantern, then they'll start to produce some more. Bring back the Braxy Lantern. No, that's smart, though, to, because they said in the first couple of months after the incident and then uh, every, you know, the first couple of months after the incident, about ten to 15,000 people came to the area because mm-hmm. they'd seen it. And the, I- Ivan Sanderson's article that he wrote like days after it happened was for the Nash- the North American Newspaper Alliance. And so his article just got just put in newspapers across the country that he didn't, you know, he didn't even know about. So people would travel there. You got to have something for sale. People love merch. Oh, yeah. I mean, a gift shop merch. Even now, okay. even now they say, you know, most of the people that come there are there for the, the Flatwoods monster. Most people that go to the visitor center they're not there for the visitor center. It's attached to the monster museum and yeah. they're really going for that. Exactly. It's like, well, you had to think that a monster museum would attract, if it attracted people, you know, back in the fifties and sixties, it's definitely with the rise of the internet going to attract people today. Mm-hmm. So all that to say, restock the lanterns. Yeah, we need those lanterns. <laughs> I need the merch. Perhaps not as widely known as his West Virginia cousin, Mothman, the Flatwoods monster has still made a significant cultural influence. On September 9th of this year, the Flatwoods Monster Convention was held at the Flatwoods Convention Center. This preceded the much-anticipated return of the annual Mothman Festival, which took place September 16th and 17th, after having been on a three-year hiatus. T-shirts, artistic prints, figurines, and toys all feature the iconic red-faced hooded figure. The video game Fallout 76 pays tribute to the cryptid with tours offered in the town that allow attendees to visit places featured in the game. So you're saying we need to be there in West Virginia from the 9th to the 17th minimum, the 18th, I guess, for if, travel. If, if the dates carry over to next year, yes, that is what I'm saying. We need to block <laughs> off the month of September, yeah. and we'll be recording from West Virginia. On the ground in West Virginia. Yes. That sounds like the plan. <laughs> Sinisterhood will be right back. One of the things I like to do whenever I'm trying to learn a new thing is re-listen to things over and over. If I listen to a podcast or an interview or, lucky me, a class, if I can get a class on demand, that's how I do. I thrive, especially with being able to listen and rewatch. That's the magic of master class is my David Sedaris class. I can re-listen to my Aaron Sorkin class. I took about writing any in my writing classes. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not feeling very inspired. I can go back and listen to the classes on demand. And I feel like I can get, get my, uh, get it all back in there. Oh yeah. I am a v- very visual learner too. So not just listening, but being able to watch too really helps it all sink in for me. Well, this fall, learn from the best to become your best with Masterclass, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Whether you're watching Masterclass on TV, listening in audio mode, in the app, or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. I mean, you got to ask yourself, how much is going to take... You have to ask yourself, how much is it going to cost to take a one-on-one class with, I don't know, Samuel L. Jackson, Amy Poehler? You tell me. A, a world lot, renowned- I imagine. Probably <laughs> probably not even an option, honestly. Easily. Like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like a Michelin chef. They probably wouldn't even do it for any amount of money. Mm-mm. But with a master class annual membership, it's $10 a month. The membership started $120 for a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180 plus master class instructors. You can negotiate with Chris Voss. You can manage your relationship relationships with Esther Perel. There's so many different choices in so many categories. It's amazing. I mean, you really have so many things at your fingertips that otherwise you would not, you would just wouldn't have that type of access to. Oh, yeah. It's like masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. You can boost your confidence, find practical takeaways that you can apply to your life and work. And if you own a business like us or your team leader, maybe use Masterclass to empower and create future ready employees and leaders. I I love Masterclass. Christy loves Masterclass. We've given it as gifts. We have it. There are over 180 classes to choose from and they add new classes every month. I'm actually waiting. They have a new Amy Poehler class, but it hasn't been released yet. 
But anything you want, like I said, my writing classes, I love the David Sedaris writing class. There's classes on filmmaking. And I found that I, when I love someone's work, I want to know the mechanics behind it. And that's the beauty of masterclass, whether it's acting or directing or even the non-artsy things. I'm just more into the artsy stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There's sports, cooking, gardening. It's There's everything you could imagine is there. And right now, our listeners will get an additional 15% off an annual membership at masterclass.com slash creepy. Get 15% off right now at masterclass.com slash creepy. Masterclass.com slash creepy. The mystery of the Flatwoods monster's origin remained to this day. Was it a visitor from another planet? A top secret military aircraft? A successful prank pulled off by local use? or an exaggerated tale caused by mass hysteria. Radio announcer Don Lamb composed a ballad about the creature that was played on local radio stations after the event. The chorus, originally sung by Cindy Cobb and later covered by Judith Day, nicely sums it up. The phantom of Flatwood from the moon or from Mars, maybe from God and not from the stars. Please tell us why you fly o'er our trees, the end of the world, or an omen of peace. I'm sorry I didn't have my harpsichord to play along like Judith Day. She crushes it. I showed the video to Ellen. She goes, what is she playing? And I said, a harpsichord. I actually have one. And she was like, what? I have an old harpsichord that was my dad's. What? And yeah, Ellen was like, where is it? And I was like, I think it's in the attic. I got to find it. I've never known how to play it. I want to learn how to play. It's such a unique instrument and one you hardly ever see anymore. Yeah. To be able to play that, uh, that would be so much fun. You'd have, it's like a thing you bust out and you make up songs about cryptids with the children. It's like around the fire. Some people around the campfire bust out their, you know, guitar and have an acoustic set. I'm like, Mm -hmm. Hey, gather around for my harpsichord. <laughs> you get the harpsichord. I'm going to get a washboard and a spoon. And yes. we're like, boom, 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 boom. I'll be the percussion and you be the melody. We got this. We Sounds got a family perfect. band. <laughs> well, so what do we think? Okay. Well, I have a whole theory. I think I know what it is. What Tell is me it? what you think and I'll go. I'll have my theory. Honestly, My gut tells me that this is something man-made, something that is like a military type aircraft and it, it crashed and they didn't want to admit that it was a military aircraft. I think maybe, I don't know as far as what they saw, it seems like it was mechanic in nature. So perhaps there was some kind of robot thing in the craft that also the government was testing out, you know, like um, essentially something that could fly it. And if it got shot down, it's not going to be a, a human life taken, but could still like gather intel and info. I don't know. It doesn't as much as I want to believe this was an actual alien sighting. For some reason, I just don't. But I want to. Right. I think I think you're on the same lines. Did we make the mechanic machine or did somebody from under the ocean or from another planet make it? That part we don't know. But the the timing specifically and in West Virginia, like I said, there's something about the proximity to D.C. that tells me that there's either like a CIA men in black like there's or like, you know, top secret security clearance kind of thing going on. Mm -hmm. Because in 1924, a farmer there was a crash in the forest and it's 1924. So we don't have 747s. We don't have big jets. He witnessed something crash in the forest and he went out there and it was documented by a news reporter. And in later years, the news reporter said at the time it was a cylindrical object with these like windows on the side, no wings or anything. It was really weird. But then he said in, you know, once modern day aircraft, you was more widely accessible. He's like, it really looked like the fuselage of a plane with no wings. Mm. And so it, whatever it was in 1924 it looked totally weird and alien and foreign to them so they called the police out when the police they said it was as big as a battleship like and we were just on a battleship i mean this huge thing that's this like big long cylinder and when they the farmer went and got the sheriff they go out there they found people already at the site in suits one was in like a silver suit like touching parts of it and others were in like suit and tie suits Mm -hmm. and kind of just said 
hey, you're good to go. Like, uh, we, we got this covered. And the sheriff, the farmer, and this local reporter were like, okay, well, we'll leave. Well, the local reporter's like, I'm not proud of it, but I saw like a weird chunk of something on the ground. And I was like, I'm just going to slip it in my pocket. I'll poke around it, see if I can figure out what it is. So he said he goes home, falls asleep, 3 a.m. His door, he's like, knock, knock, knock. And he said he opens the door. It's the guy in the, uh, one of the guys from, in the suits from the crash site was like, we know you took something. And he said, yeah, you're right. He said he went and got it, gave it to the guy, and then the guy said, okay, thanks, and like walked off. But the the reporter said what was odd was that the man in the suit had neither a car nor a horse to get down what would be a long country road. Mm. So he just sort of walked off into the forest, and that was it. And so that happened in 1924 in Braxton County, West Virginia. And then to have, in 1952, mm-hmm. this other accident. And so just seeing the repetitiveness the repetitiveness of like seeing things in the sky weird things crashing being kept away from the sites i think it would it's like being you know nearby a base of some kind if it's not extraterrestrial it's the fucking government fucking stuff up mm-hmm. and then not wanting they're like hey uh don't come over here and so if this were some experimental aircraft what ivan sanderson who of course like he was a biologist first and then sort of started investigating this whimsical thing, this kind of like, you know, cryptids and whatever giant animals and all this. While he definitely wants to believe in something outrageous, outrageous, he kept on bringing it back to the drawings and the descriptions really, really resembled like old timey, what at the time would have been cutting edge, but to us would be old timey cutting edge diving suits. That would be an, uh, some type of an underwater diving suit. So is it, you know, the somebody in the Air Force or whatever was supposed to actually like land, launch themselves out, land in the water and see if this new, like you said, it's something to prevent the loss of human life, that it's an ejector that also has a space uh, uh, underwater helmet. And then the people saw it and were just like, that's an alien. But all that to say, the whole, you know, it was a 17 foot tall green monster and it had reptile skin. It looked like a yoked Oscar the Grouch. I was sexually attracted to it. I don't know how I feel. All that. <laughs> The May brothers never said any of that. Like Mm -hmm. they said, Ed May said, it looked like a B-52 rocket that the Germans flew over and hit London with. And then he said it was mechanical over and over. Fred said it was nothing alive. It was mechanical. It was pointed at the top. It had portholes. I've said this in every interview I've ever had. It looked like on a ship with a porthole and behind the porthole was light. So it could have been that the helmet was lighted or something. He said he thought it was something had crashed and that was some type of sentinel, whether it was a, like you said, a robot sent out there to just stand next to it and shine a light on anybody coming to touch this crash they were supposed to, or if there was a person inside of it maneuvering it. But the long arms with the two fingers or the claws on the end of it, old timey diving suits from the 50s looked like that. They had these like pincher claws on it. Like Wally? Kind of look like Wally, yeah. Like I'll put it's in the show notes. There's a somebody's job is to scan old pictures of diving suits from like 1910. Some of that shit's like Godspeed. It's, it's it's how did we ever that you got in that? No, I mean it's just pure iron cast met like you'd sink like a stone. Which yes. I guess if you're trying to go to the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> that's okay. But yeah. it seems like you would be so weighted down. It would be hard to move. <laughs> but that's what you want. You want to like sink you down so you can see whatever. And then I guess they pull you back up. But that's Ivan Sanderson. Like I said, for all the whimsy and weird stuff he likes, he said it was not a man or a monster. It was some sort of a machine like a diving bell. So if it's, you know, whatever. He also separately said that all of those six crafts seen that night flying in formation were some type of UFO extraterrestrial. And that when they, the ones that flew over West Virginia and hit the air that had carbon in it, that basically it's like carbon filled air from all the coal mines that are operational Mm -hmm. around there, that it choked out their engines. Like maybe if the engines run on oxygen and they get into a poly blended atmosphere that causes it some sort of a malfunction and that's why it crashed or whatever. That was kind of more the whimsical alien side of it. But I think there's something about this like, mistaken you know they're like they said they're not stupid i think they really did see something i don't think they're making it up but they are not sophisticated with military grade underwater or aerial technology to be able to go oh that was clearly an x5000 diving suit they're like there's a goddamn alien in the woods yeah i think i don't think that um anything human or even of organic material was really involved i think it was probably all 
mechanic in nature and whether that's a recovery item that was sent there before the people showed Mm up or it was in the craft and got, you know, tossed out during the, the crash or something. But I think it was government related. And I think that's why the town was soon teeming with uh, FBI and all sorts of officials because they're like, we got to get that shit back. Right. They're like, don't or let somebody see it. walks off with it. And we got to go knocking on their door at 3 a.m. Cause we don't want anybody to know what we're doing. No. Right. I think that you're right. It's like, it, it's something they don't want anyone to be able to see. And it also probably don't want any to hurt anybody. If it has some type of a, the oil is leaking out or there is gas or hot air spewing out. You don't want a bunch of kids up there poking around it. And you know, their parents are all mad because they got all burned from the crash. Well, descriptions of the gas that they smelled are what mustard gas smells like. And that is that is something that uh, a different investigator pointed out and said multiple, multiple of the people that were witnesses ended up having cancer of some type. Miss mm-hmm. May, both of the brothers, uh, whether, you know, of course, environmental, you live around a bunch of uh, coal, coal mines, mines. Or, yeah. you know, whatever. But Ivan Sanderson pointed that out too, of like that ridge, if it wasn't extraterrestrial, if you're up there, you can like see these smoking areas. And if we, that encounter show where it seemed like the crafts are attracted to areas of like nuclear testing or facilities that might look dangerous. If you don't know what a coal mine is, you just see the ground smoking. You might want to go look at it. Mm-hmm. Now also, does that air tend to stink? Possibly, you know, or it's mustard sure, gas. Yeah. Or, but yeah, you're right. If it was like a, a military craft with mustard gas canisters and it crashed and they, it starts hissing mm-hmm. and leaking out. Yeah. You should run and you probably will vomit because you've just been exposed to this horrible thing. But I think you're right. As far as the organic, you know, it not being a monster or like a living thing, but that's just the newspapers searching through old newspapers for this. It, besides the follow up interviews with Miss May going like, please stop calling me about this. She was like, <laughs> she literally said in 1973, I'm sick of this. Stop calling me. But you, people would report like they would just go up there and knock on her door and ask her about it, call her, write her letters. So it became, she kind of became this figurehead of, bringing people to Flatwoods, which I think is a wonderful uh, legacy for her that she's, you know, this town now has this whole lovely festival and all these chairs and this creature and stuff. Great stuff for their economy. Definitely. It's become a tourist attraction. Now where the crash site happened is on private property. So you can't get there. So the museum is kind of, you know, the one-stop shop to see all of that stuff in one location. No, it is. But you're, but I, that it's a fun character and I'm glad, you know, they have Mothman already, but also this other part of the state has this flatwoods, but the newspaper people were just trying to sell papers. And that's what both the May brothers said. He was like, they would take what we said and they would, you know, twist it or make stuff up. And I found one that was like, is this the Braxton County monster? And it was a driver for a company called Dutch oven bakery. Huh? Yeah. But he said, Oh my gosh, I saw this creature. And then they described it and it was like a 10 foot tall um, person with, or not a 10 foot, it was like an eight foot tall covered in hair, kind of sounded like a Bigfoot Mm -hmm. walking with its arms dragging. I'm like, okay, well you, that's a separate thing. You do have a Bigfoot, but then to, (laughs) but that kind of muddies the water and then it makes people go, oh, well it's all made up and the May family's crazy and they just made it up. But it's not like they made money from it. And in fact, the boys were bullied for it. And she eventually said, stop talking to me about it. So I think it's people that witness some sort of a crash and then no official explanation of it. And then they had to just, uh, they they ran with it and made it a positive spin at the end for the city. I imagine you come across anything that you don't recognize and it's alarming. And I would be fearful too if something crashed and I didn't recognize what it was. Right. And especially if a a strange odor was coming out of it and made me feel sick. But yeah, it all reads like government stuff to me. And I think that it is a very fun character and I like what it's done for this town. It's put them on the map and allows them to have an economy that they might not Mm -hmm. otherwise. Uh, Like Point Pleasant is, I watched one person earlier they're like it's basically run on a mothman uh, inspired economy you know i mean like that's good for them they get so many more people there but good for them sinisterhood we'll be right back i think that who we really need to hear from though is our expert our junior researcher i think that's what that's who's what do we think we want to know what ella thinks yes 
Hello. Hello. So what do you think the Flatwoods monster was? Monster? A monster? Where do you think he came from? Outer space. So you think he was an alien? Yeah. You have to talk because they can't see that you nod your head. Yes. What do you think he was coming here to do? Um, to do help people. Bobby, Bobby, ah. To help people. To help. It's going to help people. What would you do if you saw the Flatwoods monster? Be nice to him. Yeah. That's, That's very idea. sweet. What would you say to him if you came up on him and his, you saw his, his craft had crashed and he was stinky and he looked a little upset, like he needed help. What would you say to him? I will help you. That's very <laughs> sweet. Did you have fun um, helping us research this topic? Yep, yep, yep. You like drawing the pictures? Yes. What did you say the other day to daddy? Did you say you want to work on the podcast? Yeah. Yeah, when you grow up. Oh. You're already our junior researcher, so there's you only have up to go from here. <laughs> Step one accomplished. You're already Granted, hired. I'm going to be accused of nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> the classic nepo baby. <laughs> but we love it. Some people, Ella, some people think that the Flatwoods monster isn't real and that it's only an owl. But what do you think? He is real. You don't Thanks. think he was an owl? No, I do not think he is a barn owl. Oh, Barnell. Yeah, she, she knew knows. what kind. Mm-hmm. She knows. <laughs> Thank you. Take that, Joe Nickel. <laughs> would you Would you want one day to go to the Flatwoods Monster Museum to see stuff from the Flatwoods Monster? Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh Do you know not too far from there is where the Mothman sighting happened? So we could see Mothman stuff and Flatwood stuff. What do you think about that? Mothman stuff. Mothman? And Flatwood stuff. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool, right? West Virginia's got a lot a lot of cool cryptids. Well, we really appreciate your help with this episode, and we hope that you help us with some more in the future. Would you like that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank well, you for being with us. What do you want everybody to remember about the Flatwoods monster? To be nice to him. There you go. I think that's good advice just in general. No matter what. (laughs) Can you say, keep it creepy? Keep it creepy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you heard it here. Uh, He (laughs) is real. He's not a barn owl. And we should all be nice to him. That's the, I think that's the perfect way to wrap it up is, Mm -hmm. you know what? Believe and not only believe, but be kind. Thank you, Ella, for the lesson. We can all take that with us this week. Believe and be kind. Love it. Flatwoods monster. The one (laughs) lesson. I'm so happy that she did this. Thank you so much for including her. Oh, thank you for, uh, of course, you're going to have her included. It wasn't even like, um, you mean Ella wants to help? You're like, yeah, of course. What does she want to do? She can do anything. She want to read the whole thing? We go into West Virginia. What are we doing here? Yeah, I'm like, I'm in 1000%, whatever. (laughs) Are you telling me a kid is into cryptids? I'm here to fan that flame. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Not that she needs it whatsoever. She's good to go on that well, like earlier when y'all were it was just she and i talking and i'm like do you like flatwoods you like this she's like the order is nessie then Mo- then for flatwoods then nessie then mothman i was like <laughs> okay all right so she she's knows she's a woman who knows what she likes i love that all right well, well thank you so much ella i love you and i'm so glad that you got to help us with this and see what mommy does because it's a hard thing to explain <laughs> so it is a hard thing to explain. you know you learn by doing so <laughs> exactly well welcome to the team kid <laughs> Well, if you like our free episodes, you'll love our Patreon bonus content. You can join for free to see what we're up to next or dive into over 500 hours of bonus content. We have a mini-sode coming up that is the harrowing tale of how a very brave woman escaped being the victim of a serial killer who was on a rampage in her area. A super violent, horrifying serial killer. Mm-hmm. And what a What a brave soul. For recent patrons, thank you so much for supporting the show and make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. 
Hey, you can also head to SinisterHood.com and click on Shop on the top banner to check out Sinisterhood merch like t-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers, and even clothes for your junior researcher of cryptids in your life. And for a limited time, orders over $20 from our TikTok shop have free shipping within the U.S. So check out our shop there. We're trying a new thing out to see how it works. Uh, But go to SinisterHood.com and click Shop to shop the full collection. And you get to watch a bunch of cool TikToks. So two for two. While you're at SinisterHood.com, you can also review the show, follow us on socials, and check out the episode description for more fun, like topic-based playlists and links to live show tickets. We will be at Obsessed Fest this weekend, the 21st through the 22nd. We have our live show on Saturday at 1245, followed by the meet and greet. So you can go to SinisterHood.com slash live shows for information on that or obsessedfest.com and pick up tickets there. We'll see you there. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We're also on YouTube and TikTok at Sinisterhood Podcast. You can catch us on Cameo as well for all of your custom video shout outs. If you don't know, you go on Cameo, you pick your favorite creators like Christy and I, and you have us deliver a custom video shout out to the person in your life who needs it. It could be happy birthday, happy anniversary. We've done some pep talks, some congrats on the finalization of your divorce, some assistance with a, a community play on how to do accents. Literally, it's just a way for you to connect with us if it's for yourself or someone you love. It's one of our favorite things to do. So go to cameo.com and search us up uh, Sinisterhood and have us do a custom video shout out for you or somebody you love today. Where are you at, Christy? I'm on Instagram at Christy and Wallace and TikTok at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on the internet at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Rochelle Allman. Shelby Crutcher. Ashley Picot. Gwen Stratton. Kirsty Hind. Samantha Van Dyke. Amy Oz. Barbara Love, Melissa Laurent, Haley Vincent, Jessica Ake, Maria E. Castignaro, Jensen Hemmerich. Thank you so much for supporting the show. We could not do this without you. We hope you pronounce your names correctly. We love each and every one of you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. <laughs> keep it creepy. Sinister. Do you like it more than Nessie? Yes. You like it more than Mothman? No. So Mothman, then Flatwoods, then Nessie? No, it goes like this. Flatwoods, okay. Nessie, Mothman. Ooh. Nice. Bop-y-bop. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>